Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship and a warm welcome to our visitors this morning. You'll notice it on the back of the altar of service. Um, huge thank you to those who organised and supported the fundraiser, the car boot on Denham Green last week. It was fairly quiet with people, but we still raised £85.50 for our church funds. I am on leave from this coming Saturday uh, for two weeks until Saturday the 12th of August. Lisa Jane Rankin will be providing pastoral cover and any other queries can you contact um, Relevant Session Park uh, Laura. Laura is also on holiday but has agreed to have her mobile with her, um, which is very kind of her, much appreciated. Uh, next Sunday, worship is led by Reverend Douglas Nicholl in Denham Church. And then the following week you have a united service led by the worship group at 10.15 in Minto Church. We have settled on a new time for united services, so all united services from now on will be at 10.15. And the week after that is also a united service at South Dean. And that replaces the normal afternoon Sudan Kirk that Tom Kirk and South Dean have always had. But we've moved it into South Dean Church because of the weather. It's always a bit unpredictable. Um, so it has become a united service at South Dean in two weeks' time. Since the beginning of June, we've been considering what it means to be missional congregations through a semi-continuous series of sermons on the five marks or aspects of mission. And there is an abbreviated description of these on the back of your order of service. There's been a couple of breaks in this series to accommodate special services and a slight reordering so that we could have the fifth mark of, on creation as an outdoor service in Denham. So today we're finishing our series with the fourth mark of mission, to transform. The original form of this mark read, to seek to transform the unjust structures of society. But in 2012, a further addition was made to add to challenge violence of every kind and to pursue peace and reconciliation. As we reflect on this mark of mission in our worship today, there will be themes and ideas that recur from our reflections over the past weeks. For none of these aspects of mission stand in isolation, but interweave with one another. It seems that we have probably ended up completing our series with the most challenging of all five marks of mission. But we should not be daunted by this, for as we discovered at the very beginning, mission is about finding out what God is already doing and joining in. Come and praise God. In the company of God's people, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Great are the works of God, full of glory and majesty. Our God is gracious and compassionate. Our God is merciful and forgiving. Our God is faithful and trustworthy. Our God is just and good. So come, let's worship God together. God's praise will last forever. And so we sing him 348, Praise the one who breaks the darkness. 348.
children of God, it's time to take off your shoes, step out of your comfort zone and wade with trust into the stream of God's mercy. Stand still for a moment, barefoot on holy ground. Let the healing waters wash your feet. Take a deep breath as love soaks into your soul. Be silent and listen for God's word to us today. So we listen to words from the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. How shall we worship our God? We have heard what the Lord requires of us. Leave empty talk and pride behind. We must walk the walk. Prepare to step out in faith even into troubled waters. Only God knows where we might need to go. Don't be afraid. Jesus will guide our steps along the way, teaching us to walk humbly, to love boldly, to serve God with body, soul, mind and strength. And so let us pray for the humility and courage to follow where the Spirit leads. Let us pray. God of good news, we pray you, praise you, bringing in your kingdom in Jesus. You have given us a glimpse of heaven's glory here on earth. God of the poor, we praise you, bringing an end to the cycle of want. You have given us a vision of your good gifts shared by all. God of the captive, the oppressed, we praise you, bringing words of liberation, unlocking prison doors. You have given us a revelation of freedom in you and fullness of life. The eyes of all look to you and praise your holy name. God of the poor, the oppressed, those lacking vision, forgive us when we get so caught up in bad news that we lose sight of the hope of your kingdom here and now. Forgive us for the times we choose not to see the possibilities of kingdom living, for closing doors, not opening them, for shutting folk down, not raising them up, for being more concerned with our own agenda and kingdoms, and not yours. May your spirit of life and liberation, power and possibility, flow in and through us, that we may proclaim the day of your favour and be bearers of your good news for all. We join together now in the words of prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue our worship by singing 283. The voice of God goes out to all the world. 283.
dedicate our offering to God. Let us pray. We come, loving God, hoping to know you, to be close to you, to find community amongst your beloved children. We come, loving God, with thanks and praise, to offer these tokens of our time, talent and money in the hope that they will be used to bring your message to more people and your love to the whole world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Gospel reading today is Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 30. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Thanks be to God for his word to us today. We sing now hymn 362, Heaven Shall Not Wait, 362.
Lord, take my words and speak through them. Take our thoughts and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's not fair, is the often familiar cry of a child over a perceived wrong against them, whether it be too small a share of pudding, or whether it requests to do a task which others are not. When Jesus told us to take notice of children, the notion of fairness isn't perhaps what springs to mind. Yet the indignation of children against unfairness is something we should consider in our outlook upon society and the world. How often as adults do we cry, it's not fair, on behalf of others. For there is no denying we live in a very unfair world, where people suffer through no fault of their own. Children are also quick to let the world know when someone else has inflicted violence against them, and to seek redress. Left to their own devices, they may react in kind, but in modern society, they're encouraged to help engage the help of an adult to help put things right in non-violent ways. Again, are we as adults as willing to stand up for peace and non-violent action in the wider world? In the fourth mark of mission, we are challenged to help transform the injustices in our society to challenge violence of every kind and pursue peace and reconciliation. As I said at the beginning of our worship, in many ways this is possibly the most challenging of the five marks of mission to act upon. We may feel we lack the confidence for the first two marks to tell and teach the gospel, but we do know what the gospel is and can rely on the Holy Spirit to give us the right words. The third and fifth marks to tend to the poor and treasure our created world, require practical action that we can quite readily identify. We can provide for the poor and needy by giving just a small fraction of our personal wealth, or look after the planet by doing our bit of recycling, without considering what greater action we could take to prevent the need for these things in the first place. But this fourth mark of mission really requires us to stand up for what we believe, to challenge the status quo of society, and it can put us at odds with our friends and neighbours. When we are sick, we may display symptoms that can be treated to ease discomfort, but without identifying and treating the root cause of our illness, we cannot be cured. Likewise, poverty, violence, crime, are all symptoms of sickness in society, and we have to identify and treat the underlying causes. In both cases, getting to the root of a problem can be an exhausting process. It takes considerably more time and effort than dealing only with the surface symptoms. It often requires change, which is seldom easy. But in the end, it is the only path that leads to wholeness and health. The call for justice and peace goes right back to the Old Testament prophets. The prophet Micah tells the people that God was not interested in extravagant acts of sacrifice, but also requires an ethical response that manifests itself in social concern for others. In Isaiah chapter 61, we are given a vision of the kind of kingdom that will be brought about by God's messenger. And it is this passage that we hear Jesus read in the synagogue in Luke. Those listening are at first happy to hear Jesus preach. They are in awe that one of their own, the son of Joseph the carpenter, can speak so well. But things quickly turn sour when they hear what Jesus preaches and realise that their liberation is tied up with that of the poor, the prisoners, the blind and the oppressed. This is not what they wanted to hear. The Nazarenes were expecting his gracious words to be followed by a public display of healing and miracles, proof that even though he was only the carpenter's son, he could indeed perform the miracles they had heard about. Yet Jesus knew 
that even the most spectacular display of miracles would not eliminate their doubts about his mission. And so he refused to bow down to their sense of entitlement. He knew already they would be held back by their unbelief. And so instead he speaks of the rejection of prophets in their hometowns and how the miracles of former prophets were performed for Gentiles, not Jews. Jesus' sermon was his mission statement as to what the kingdom of God would look like and hints at the universal nature of his calling. His messianic mission would not be a one-off event that saw the world transformed in a matter of years. It would be an ongoing transforming of the world by all who believe in him. But these believers need to accept that they need to be transformed by the Spirit in order to be able to spread the good news to others. The Nazarenes were not ready for this. In fact, they were so unwilling to accept Jesus' message, they sought to throw him off the cliff to his death. So how do we ensure that we are more receptive to Jesus' message and willing to play our part in making the world a fairer and more peaceful place which reflects the kingdom of God? Perhaps the best starting place is to increase our awareness of what is happening in the world, of how injustice and oppression are present even on our own doorsteps. We often hear the word woke bandied about often in a disparaging manner in the popular press, to describe anything too liberal or progressive. Yet the original use of the word woke as slang by the African-American community meant to be generally well informed or up to date. Only in the last few years has the focus shifted to being alert to racial or social discrimination or injustice. One could argue that this definition of the word could easily be applied to Jesus, who refused to let race, gender, poverty or sickness be a barrier to his love and acceptance. To refuse to have an awareness of injustice and discrimination is to reject the progressive change that Jesus wants in this world. Jesus lived in this world, but insisted he was not of this world rejecting riches and honour and taking on the role of servant. He was a prophetic voice that pointed out human hypocrisy, challenged human systems of oppression. He was and is the incarnation of God, who is a God of justice, liberation and peace. God dreams of a world that is renewed and restored, where people are healed and made whole, and the building of this new world begins with each one of us. By making ourselves aware of the inequalities in this world, by exploring the underlying causes and being willing to speak out against them. Every year Oxfam produces a report and then 1992, no, try again, January 2022 report on inequality kills talks about the level of economic inequality in the world which increased dramatically as a result of the pandemic. Because of COVID-19, the wealth of the 10 richest men has doubled, while the income of 99% of humanity is worse off. 252 men have more wealth than all of the 1 billion women and girls in Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean combined. Inequality contributes to the death of at least one person every four seconds. If you read the report, there is more. And if you read this year's report, it goes on to say that basically the inequality is increasing in society as we go on. It is our duty as Christians to keep abreast of such information and act upon it. Where do we see signs of sickness in our communities and in our society? Where do we see situations that call for speaking the truth? Where are the wrongs that need to be made right? Where is there an obvious need for reconciliation and healing? Where do we see God already at work? Where God reigns there is no oppression, no exploitation, no hatred, violence or injustice. This was the vision of the prophets. It was the vision of Jesus. 
And it is this reign of God for which we pray when we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. The building of this reign of God begins with each one of us. It begins with the awareness of how we comply with and benefit from unjust structures and the willingness to change. It begins with honestly assessing our own fears, prejudices and hatreds and eliminating every form of violence from our own lives. It begins with the cultivation of peace in our own hearts, in our families and communities, in our churches and in our workplaces. And then it spreads to our neighbours, to our fellow citizens and to our world. As the former Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, once said, the church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. The church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. May we each continue to be an instrument of change that benefits far more of God's children than we can possibly imagine and brings about his kingdom here on earth. Amen. Let's take a moment of silence to reflect on God's word to us this morning. Lord God, empower each and every one of us to be the change that we need to be in this world, to bring an end to inequality, an end to oppression, an end to violence, and bring in a kingdom of peace. Amen. <coughs> we say you now 706 for the healing of the nations, 706.
Let us pray. Gracious God, our Creator and our Source, we present ourselves today and every day in thanks for your word, for your guidance and for your love. As we seek to be ever more like you and more fully ourselves, we come before you in prayer. We pray for our troubled world, torn apart by greed, by a failure of stewardship, by inequality and by disease. Help us to find new ways and new strengths to help and to heal, to bring justice and your saving message to all whom we meet. For our communities, as we search for ways to break down barriers between us, shine your light of love into the darkness of ignorance and distance. Help us to embrace your life-giving commandment to love our neighbours as ourselves. For your churches, as we seek to find our place in this world of competing priorities, we ignite the flame of faith in the hearts of your beloved children. Help us to find new ways to spread your mission and message to a world so in need of your love. We pray for all those in pain, all those bereaved, all those doubting, all those struggling, all those on the margins, all those caring, all those searching, and all those we each hold in our hearts. We pray for our searching selves as we try to live as you tell us, and we ask for your unending support to help us to be more like you and embrace who you have made us to be, just as we are. Amen. Our closing hymn is 621, Spirit of Jesus, If I Love My Neighbour, 621.